we have to navigate capitalism. We can't escape that. We have to navigate the market. We have to figure out how to create something that's important to us, but that is also valuable to people. Letters to a young poet, Rilke said, the only test of a work of art is did you need to create it, right? If something grabs you and you absolutely have to make it, probably it's going to be meaningful. Hello, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. On the show, I interview peak performing innovators in the creative, social impact, and earth conservation spaces. I also bring you ideas and techniques that you can grab and use to set goals, create, and unlock your potential for changing yourself and the world. And now let's get to the show. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. Thank you so much for being here. I'm super excited about this guest because he's working in a field that I didn't really know was a field, and yet makes so much sense. Let me tell you about Zach Slingsby. Zach is a writer, short film creator, and founder of Human Factor Media. It's an award-winning branded storytelling company that has worked with leading brands and publishers to create videos, people, actually want to watch. Whoa. Zach graduated from Fordham University, received his MFA from the New School, and is published in over a dozen creative and industry publications. He believes the ingredient that makes a literary story great is the same one that makes for a great video, which I love. If you know anything about me, you know how much I love storytelling. His company is based between Nashville, Tennessee, here in the USA, where he lives, and also New York City, collaborating with brands to create stories and films instead of ads and interruptions. Ah, that is music to my ears. Zach, thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So I am... I, you and I were chatting a little bit before we started recording the show, which kind of makes me wish we had recorded it because we we are talking about this notion of branded entertainment and and how that is sort of potentially going to replace commercials. So I would love to just go to the very beginning of that is and ask you, what is branded entertainment? Mm, good question. In the simplest way, it's when I think it's when brands engage storytellers to do their bidding instead of, let's say, marketing professionals mm. uh, or or advertisers, right? Okay. So instead, a brand um, wants to get the word out because they people for them to be successful, people need to know they exist. So they have to uh, send out a flare into the world. They have no choice, right? So how do they do that? Up until very recently. The only real way that they would do it is to try to cram what was valuable about their product or service into a 15 or 30 second spot. And the narrator kind of racing through adjective laden copy to try to explain mm -hmm. uh, what was very important about this thing and why it was important to your life, why it was relevant to you and you should buy it. Um, now there's this other option, which is we have channels uh as brand, brands have these channels where they can communicate any way they want and it doesn't they're not don't have to be in a rush they don't have to be selling their product they don't even have to be talking about their product the goal can be engagement entertainment and a, a connection um so if the go, if the kind of goalposts move in that direction uh, brands now have a chance at connecting with people in a way that previously was totally unavailable to them. They can stop being disruptive and irritating and self-interested, and they can start to offer value in the, in the realm of entertainment. I'm taking all of that. And you'll notice that I do this. I, I like to warn everybody that I talk to. When I hear something that makes me want to think, I want to take a moment. And instead of dead air, like DJs of old used to call it, I call it anticipatory air. So give this me a second. Air, I, love it. All right. <laughs> I want to take a second and think about what you just said, because this this notion and, and we we talked about it earlier, that it's that it's no longer about I'm going to push my brand down your throat, that the brand that the, the, the product, let's say, is actually almost incidental. It's part of the story instead of being the reason for the story. Can you talk a little bit about how that is evolving? And, and frankly, what gave you the idea that this is something that could work? Yeah, I don't really remember exactly why I thought this would be a good idea. I think I saw I saw a few things happen at once. 
Um, I would see videos and I would be surprised that they were coming from brands. I'd say, well, well, they didn't sell anything. What's the point of this video? And then I realized that, you know, there was a longer term proposition for them. Um, um, Red Bull is a famous example in MeUndies and there's some whiskey brands that do a very good job of this. And uh, there were some branded web series kind of in the 2010, early 2010s um, that were um kind of a wink and a nod they weren't trying too hard to be entertaining but they were you know there were examples out there mm -hmm. and then I, I happened to be on a train and i was talking to a guy about his business and he was telling me all the ways that he was thinking of getting the word out there and i don't know it's something clicked where i said well why aren't these people making you know videos that you would find on funny or die or hulu or some other streaming platform you know what why wouldn't they want to take a chance at entertaining people the way that our favorite shows entertain us because the value of that seems to be undeniable. Um, and then I, I researched it a little bit and I was stunned to find out how terror, how, how bad a shape the advertising business really is. Um, there, the statistics that people get excited about when they run ads are abysmal. They're, they're really, really bad. And, and most content that is uh, product driven is skipped uh, at an astonishing rate. We're gonna, the advertisers stand to lose $20 billion in skipped ads over a five year period, billion. Um, which is just wow. an unbelievable amount of money. I mean, you can imagine the stuff you could do with that amount of money if your goal was to try to inject some some humanity into content. Um, uh, at the same time, our YouTube pre-roll ad platform, which is very popular, has like an above ninety percent skip rate. So nine, so little, um, way you know more than nine out of ten of those are skipped before they're even seen. So um, you know the. It's a state of crisis. The ad world is in a state of crisis. They don't exactly know how to reach people. Banner blindness is a, is a phenomenon that has been uh, proliferating at, a, at an astonishing rate. You know, we just don't really see uh, static ads anymore. We just don't really look at them. Um, when we hear certain buzzwords, we become kind of deaf to the meaning of them. Um, you know, Anti-lock breaks, APR financing, risk-free, built tough, the best a man can get, a diamond is forever. All these things are just, they don't really ca carry any punch with us anymore. And uh, commercials um, are, it used to be kind of a necessary evil. We watch an hour long show and when the commercials came on, maybe we would talk to our friends and maybe we'd watch one or two of them. But we've gotten way too sophisticated as, as consumers at, at getting around these things that are interrupting our leisure experiences. And that's not going to go backwards. That's only going to go forwards. Mm -hmm. So it's tough to imagine a future where the ad as we know it now has a very central place in our experiences. So the question becomes, you know, what do we imagine next? Yeah, I, it, it's funny as, as I'm listening to you talk, the things that are popping up into my brain are stories that I find exciting, right? I've, I, there have been ads that I've just loved. Uh, one of my favorite was a British ad about, uh, 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 and this was his little story, right? He, he he comes in on this and on this beautiful silver tray, he's carrying a, a bottle of I'll call it Advil, even though it wasn't Advil, it was some other thing, and a glass of water, and his wife is lounging in bed, and she says, "What is this for?" And he says, "For your headache." And she says, "Well, I don't have a headache." And he goes, "Excellent, right?" <laughs> and so, and I just went that told a beautiful story without ever mentioning. The product, right? And so it, to me, and this was back in British accent, by the way. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's interesting to me when, you know, that when you were talking that popped into my head and that was from the nineties. So, so somebody, and I still remember it because it was so clever, right? So when you're, when you're doing this, when you're talking about stories and they don't have to be long stories, they can be shorter tales that, that have an impact. That takes a real creative mind. And I know, you know, you got your MFA, you're a film creator. So so looking at it from that perspective, you're telling these stories. So I would love it if you would would talk to me a little bit about how the storytelling aspect of this relates to branded yeah. entertainment. Yeah, good question. Well, what you just said is really um common, which is that people, when you talk about getting to the subject, everybody usually has one or two references of a commercial they saw or a video they saw that was, that was, that stuck out to them from a brand. And usually what's uh, remarkable about that is not that they are 
much like commercials, but how much they're unlike commercials. Mm -hmm. So they mm -hmm. usually can remember, oh, this one was so, it was very different. It's very surprising that a brand will put that out. So those are the things we, we know that kind of stick in the, in the brain. Um, and so you're talking about the other kind of component of this, which is, okay, well, if we're not going to make ads, what are we going to make and who should we get to help us with that? And, you know, why are those people qualified? And those are all good questions. Um, I think generally storytellers aren't, aren't educated into being storytellers. They're usually born that way. Mm. Um, I think, he, I mean, I know what do you actually do. What do you think about that? Cause you're, you have, you have, a, a very deep creative credentials too. I know. <laughs> Well, I, I, you know, I hate to be just a nodding head at you, but yeah, I, I agree. We're, yeah. we're, we're born that way because anytime, you know, if you're late when you're nine years old and you're late coming home and your mom wants to know why and you make up the excuse, that's being a storyteller. So I think we, it's innate. I think we do have it. And yet uh, a lot of us don't hone those skills to be purposeful storytellers like, oh, I'm going to go write a book or I'm going to become a songwriter or a movie maker or something like that. Yet we tell stories in pretty much everything we do. So that's my take on it. Right. So, so I agree. So then when you're, you know, it's really about how you want to tackle the challenge. If you're a group of people in a boardroom and you say, okay, well, let's, let's work backwards, you know, using our kind of um, data driven thinking about who our, who our consumers are and what are the elements we can put together to tell an affecting story. It's probably not going to be as effective. It's going to look pretty engineered and it mm -hmm. often does. It often mm -hmm. does look engineered and it's not really their fault because business people especially people who people who start businesses they're often uh, visionaries about one or two very specific things and then they're totally pragmatic about everything else you know so they're, they're very inspired about let's say the insight that they had that made them want to start a business but then everything else they're like what's the most efficient way we can do this what's the most pragmatic way we can do this and you can't blame them for that because they're focused on what they're what they kind of got them into this domain in the first place right um so when it comes to, you know, who is qualified to execute those story driven campaigns, I would look to people who, who would do this because they feel they don't have any other choice, who would do mm -hmm. this because they feel it's like, as you said, it's their birthright and it's just, it's, it's inscribed in them. And it's, uh, it's something that where ROI for them is important because they want to get hired again, but it's a critical afterthought The the real thing is uh, how much can we uh, reach people and, and make them feel seen and understood and perceived and and how much can we kind of find that that human factor and bring it out in content i'm nodding and thinking uh yeah absolutely i agree with you i think that the whole point of of to me what you just said was that inherent in the term storytelling is an interaction that you're telling it to someone you're not telling it to dead air right so you're you're actually communicating and interacting and so when you're when you're talking about making take making these stories i i have to ask what makes for a good one in the way you're doing this branded entertainment what makes for a good story um i think that it's different for every engagement but i think that um I, I think that a good story, you can't see through it. You know, you, you can't, um, you don't know what they're trying to get you to feel. You don't know what they're trying to get you to do. You know, it's not this, it's not obviously motivated by anything. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's just, it sort of exists um, in its own space. And it's, uh, you feel something with, you, you feel um, a sense of engagement with it. And it's, that's it. It's the, it, it doesn't ask anything of you other than to feel this kind of connection with it. Um, and you know, you, for example, if, if the point of it is to highlight a product, it's probably not a story. If the point of it is to make you aware of, you know, let's say an agenda, it's probably not a story. So there are things that just disqualify from being a story. Um, Ian Forrester has a, a great line in his uh, book aspects of a novel where he says that a story is uh, different than plot. A story, his example of a story is a king died and then the queen died. So it's just a sequence of events, things happen. Mm -hmm. He said a plot is where you develop causality. So uh, the king died and then the queen died of grief. Uh, so he adds of the queen died of grief. And now we have a connection of events and meaning. So he adds meaning to that. So the, you, know, you, you can kind of play with all these layers and say, how much do we want to make this? Um, wh where's the scale if, if zero is, you know, here's the information about our product and 100 is, 
you know, a literary journey through character and, and resonance and all the things that make up a great novel, uh, where do we want to be on that scale? And the answer is not always 100, right? Sometimes maybe the answer is 50 or 20, but, you know, you want to, I think, set it in proportion to your goals for any kind of campaign. And even so, if I if I'm a if I'm a singer and I am a singer, if I'm a singer and I'm singing a song, that song has some sort of beginning, a middle and an end. Often it'll have some sort of denouement, some some kind of bridge that will be sort of the point of the song. Right. When you're talking about this sort of branded entertainment, it, it the stories that I like the 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 little I'm going to say Advil, even though it wasn't Advil. This was yeah. more than 30 years ago. Uh, the the point of that commercial, for example, was to get you to think about this this little tablet in a whole new way. But there was a moment, there was a denouement when the guy goes, excellent, right? So, so there is that moment where you go, oh, now I understand. And there's a whole bunch more going on sort of in my brain from seeing this than just what I saw, if you see what I mean. They made me think. Yeah. So when, yeah. when you're in that place as a singer, oh, as a storyteller, you're trying to get people to think, right? You're trying to communicate and interact. How does that work with the work that you're doing? How does it work in the sense of, do we, do we aspire to that, you mean? Uh, do you aspire to it? And yeah. also, what is the process? Like, when yeah. you're thinking about developing these stories, what yeah. is the process to make sure that, that'll get, that they will get people to think deeper than just what they saw or heard? Right. So we make sure it's about something else. We make sure it's a, the, 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 there's a theme that is, mm -hmm. um, that transcends the goals of the company. And, and most of the people we work with, they want to make sure that that is true as well. Um, so we will come in usually with ideas, uh, three, we start most of our engagements with the deck of ideas, three or four concepts that we think are a good match, um, that are, um, that have some relationship to who they're trying to reach and have some ability to, you know, be placed in the lives of, of those consumers. But, you know, more importantly than that are, are themed are about something um, that is that, that kind of transcends the purpose of that product or service. Um, so that's usually a safe bet. Um, you know, so example, for example, if we are, if we are, uh, doing something for a wine company as a wine brand, as we've done, um, there's a million different distinctions in grapes and in flavor and in, and in profile and in the, the geography of where, you know, these things, where, where they're, they're, um, uh, created. Um, I can't think of the word for, for, uh, for how, how wine is christened or whatever you call it. But, um, we would say, well, more important than that is in what's what's the human context where wine is enjoyed and celebrated and what are the human dynamics that kind of take place around that? And, you know, what is it, what would be a, a human moment that we can make a, a short film around or a series around that everybody would say, oh man, that is exactly like me and my friends. Or that is exactly like, uh, you know, my what my mother always does when she opens wine. And, you know, what's the human tie-in that, can be uh, go to another level of depth than than just a simple advertising would. Hey, the the thing that I'm thinking about is relevance. Like, is it relevant yeah. to my life as the person who's watching this or, or hearing it or whatever? I, I love that, and I it I want to step back just a minute and talk to you or ask you about over the last sort of since the advent of web 2.0 social media and all of that we had this sort of uh influencer marketing right where where you would hire an influencer to go mm, i love this new vegan drink right mm. and and it was pretty obvious that this person was probably getting paid to say something and in fact often you would put down in your in your little notes if you happen to be enjoying something going i'm not affiliated with this i'm not getting any money for this i just like it so there is this push pull thing happening so i'd love it if you talk a little bit about the psychology behind these shifts the the psychology of moving towards entertainment versus advertising yeah yeah first i i want to say that i don't think it's new I think that um, there's a really interesting historical precedent for this. Uh, Ooh, cool. Uh, little known fact, soap operas were invented by soap companies mm -hmm. uh, to sell soap, you know, and that that's um, that's something that the, the, the relationship between brands and entertainment was always 
they were always kind of important counterparts to one another because brands always understood that entertainment would get attention and brands needed attention to sell their products. So the relationship between those two things has always been kind of fluid. Um, you had Colgate Comedy Hour in the 50s. Um, mm -hmm. Michelin tires uh, were, this is a weird story. So Michelin, Michelin tires, they, they, know, they knew that they could only sell so many tires so long as people were driving short distances. Mm -hmm. So they started a restaurant review service that and started to give Michelin stars out to restaurants that were far away from towns so that people would drive further, wear out their tires sooner and have to buy new tires. That's how we have Michelin star restaurants. Yikes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Dubious motives. But yes, but, uh, the, but you know, they that that is branded content. I mean, that is a, a restaurant review service and they're going to come and profile these places and give, you know, this became this this thing to this kind of christening of important or or important culinary experiences was a Michelin star. So um, how did it, your question is, how is it evolving um, and, and where's it going? So I guess, I think that, you know, you look at a Amazon is branded entertainment, you know, and when you have the Amazon prime channel, you have Amazon's a store, it's the everything store. And in the left, on the right-hand side of the store, you can shop for everything on the left-hand side of the store, they have a big movie theater. Right. And the theater shows uh, new movies and original movies and original TV shows. And they know that when you become a prime member to watch the content, prime members end up shopping three times as much as non-prime members. So entertainment is the trap that they then use to get you to stick around. You get up from the movie and you stretch and you say, Hey, come over here and we'll buy you. We'll sell you some products. Um, Jeff Bezos famously said that winning golden globes helps them sell socks. So that was the I, the motive uh, for them to go in the entertainment business. You see that on a smaller scale with Lexus and MetLife and Mountain Dew and uh, Chick-fil-A now has shorts and um, AT&T makes uh, documentaries. Samsung makes documentaries. So uh, Jack Daniels, you know, so you, you have companies kind of figured out, look, we have to find a way to be more interesting than we've been historically. We have to kind of put to bed the jingle. You know, I mean, the jingle has got us so far, but it's time to kind of figure out who we need to engage to uh, tell stories that are going to be more arresting um, than your typical skippable video. The anticipatory. Song. Yes. Sorry. I'm thinking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's what you're saying is fascinating. And we we. You know, who do we engage? We engage to me, in my mind, we engage the storytellers, people who are good at, at telling stories or writing stories are the people who would probably be great at doing what what you're talking about. And yet, you know, Apple, Apple TV, they, you know, they've won all these Emmys already. Da, 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 da. There, there's they're branching out into this sort of thing. In part, it seems to me, because we as a society, and I don't know if it's just the USA, it could be, but it seems to me we as a society are tired of people interrupting what we're doing or what we're enjoying by saying, hey, you should buy this soda. So there again, there's a psychology at work here in my mind going, yeah, but let's let's see if we can make these stories so entertaining that the person who's watching X movie doesn't turn away or doesn't fast forward through the commercials or go get up, you know, nachos or whatever during the commercial. So, so something in here has to be arresting enough that they will stay. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be a compelling story. And then, and then I have to ask as a writer myself, how do you hook people to stay in the first half a second before they go eh, fast forward or oh I'm getting up to go get another drink of water or whatever how that seems to me like it would have to be super quick in order to it? hook them yeah how do you do with your writing oh well I have I have some kind of really cool first sentence that that is going right. to shock people into thinking oh I want to know more what's it what's an exact can you give me an example uh, I'll start with one of the chapters. Yeah, Cassie flipped over the tarot card and gasped. Right, 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 right. So, so someone's shocked. We don't know why we want to keep reading to find out why they're shocked. Yeah, exactly. So some of the great, great fiction examples that have always inspired us are, are 
amazing first lines, right? Dashiell Hammett or, or Raymond Chandler would have, you know, just these amazing bit ways to begin a story. Um, and um, Michael Chabon, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning novelist, sold his first novel on the strength of the first sentence, which was uh, at the beginning of the summer, I had lunch with my father, the gangster, who was in town for the weekend to transact some of his vague business. And so in the first sentence, you have two characters, a tie to organized crime, uh, you know, relationship between a father and son, um, you know, the beginning of a summer, which usually means the beginning of an adventure. You, know, you have so much packed into a couple of words. Mm-hmm. Um, I've always been really um, uh, interested in, in that. Um, um, I think that you're, I think you're, I think that there's a perfect analog. I think uh, literature is a great analog for, for content, even though people would say that digital content is a much cheapened version of the experience, which I, I understand why people say that. And I, I think it's fair, but well, if you look at the way the first three seconds, so the, the meme is now the first three seconds have to be the hook, right? In any video. Mm-hmm. Um, usually they're trying to find something that uh, relates to the, to the viewer very quickly. They're trying mm-hmm. to find something to get, give you back some piece of your own experience at the beginning of a video. And that's a literary trick. You know, I mean, you, the novels of, of um, you know, Mark Twain or, or Flannery O'Connor or Dickens or, you know, Virginia Woolf, they had those moments buried usually in the, you know, you read and you get to the fourth chapter or the fifth chapter and you come across a line and it's about you. You know, someone else wrote this who you've never met and yet they found a way to tell you something about yourself that you thought might have been a secret. Um, and it's an amazingly powerful thing is once a, a writer can tell you that they understand you, you'll trust them with where to go next. Um, and I think that, that that phenomenon is on display in some videos, not, not all, but in some videos, I think that trick is used and, and used well. It's interesting to me. Uh, you you sparked my thought of my fr- one of my favorite first lines. Of course, is uh, it was a bright, cold day in April, and the clocks were striking thirteen, which is nineteen eighty four. Okay, Great. and yeah. you know immediately, you go bright, cold day in April. That's lovely, but why would a clock strike thirteen? It never would. What is this about? And immediately, there's an air of mystery and an air of of anticipation. And as you might guess, Zach, I like anticipation a lot. So. So within that framework, when we're talking about this, the first, I don't know, 12 words of this, arguably one of the best pieces of literature ever written, there's some, there is a mystery, there's something tantalizing there that that makes you think. And you said, Virginia Woolf and some of these other authors, some of these other storytellers were giving you something about yourself. Mm -hmm. And that to me is sort of looking at the human experience. So when you're doing that, when you're looking at the human experience and you're trying to, in the first three seconds, give the, the, the consumer or the person watching, the spectator, the observer, that bit of human experience, is it is it then, I don't even know how to ask this, is it then particular to the product that you're trying to tie in the human experience? Or are you going deeper than that and more vulnerable than that in order to find that thing that will hook someone and make them want to stay past that first three seconds? Well, it's very, it's so, it's, it's such a variable because sometimes our hands are just tied and, you know, we're, we do independent projects and when we do independent projects, we have all the leeway in the world to go to that level of depth. And, and oftentimes we do get to do that with, with branded projects, but um, uh, we did a documentary last year that we were able to get into some film festivals and we, we were, you know, we had the documentary and then we had a teaser at the very beginning. And then we teased out two or three lines that we thought cut right to the heart of the theme of it. And that was very important uh, to us. And I think played into its success to some degree. Um, we have a web series where we interview, we're putting on a, a, a releasing now, or I think by the time this podcast airs, it'll be released a web series where we interview all kinds of up and coming artists. And they, they say things, they ask questions sometimes, or they repeat questions that we've asked, or they have their own thoughts. And we extract the most relevant kind of salient examples of those and put them right up front of the video. So mm-hmm. someone will say, you know, a, a really interesting uh celebrated guitarists here in Nashville named Derek Wells. He started his, I'm just thinking of this example because we, we cut it today. He said uh, right at the beginning, you know, well, why do some people make it and some don't? You know, I mean, that's a question that is evergreen in the minds of creatives. 
For right? sure. So we, we, that's the first thing we open the video with and then we cut to the music and everything else. So you see this go on in all kinds of, um, all, all, all over social media now is, you know, they're trying to, people extracting that, the, that moment of, uh, that theme, really. I think they're extracting some line that tells the theme. Um, talking about first sentences, Anna Karenina, uh, ha, 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 let me get it right. Happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own, in its way. own way. Yeah. It's a great <laughs> first line. Right? It's so, so great. And you can't, you know, that's the whole book. It's in one line and they got it right there for you. And you can read it and say, okay, I'm in, I'm ready to go on this journey with you. And so that's a superpower that is being uh, capitalized on, I think, in varying degrees uh, by digital content. You said something that I that I, I went, oh, let's talk about this. You said that this in in this web series, which I love. I love the name, by the way. Why are Why are you famous? I think that's right, a great. I uh, yeah, I should say it's it's an it's with uh, up and coming talents and different creative fields, music and film and and literature and comedy, and it's people who are doing very well in their in their worlds. They've kind of amassed a following, doing great, but they haven't kind of crested. And it's right. called why aren't you, why aren't you why aren't famous? you famous? I think that's a great name. And and the yeah. thing is though, when we're talking about creatives, the the way creatives work in the world and succeed in the world, as far as let's let's say call it what it is, someone who wants to be a creative and sit in their bedroom and play guitar, great if that's all you want. But if you want to reach millions, you have to do things differently today than you did even five years ago. So I would love if you would give me your perspective as as a fine arts person as a filmmaker as a storyteller what is what is the best path for a creative how do creatives get to that place where they can crest as you put it oh man such a question um i know i don't ask easy questions i no, promise listen, <laughs> it's, uh, i i've wrestled with this you know throughout my career and i i think everyone else is too and i um, I had a very traditional creative beginning. I had I graduated college and I went and had, you know, small jobs and internships with literary agencies and publishing houses. All I ever wanted to be was a writer. And I um, was living in Manhattan, um, going to the MFA, as you said, the MFA program at the new school. I wrote a novel in my early 20s and I um, got literary representation right away, which was not easy to do. And I was no, pretty, con pretty convinced. Um, I had success in my early 20s. I was pretty convinced I was going to be, you know, shot out of a canon novelist very quickly. And mm -hmm. uh, people that I had uh, kind of knew or worked with or surrounded myself with kind of helped me kind of fed this myth with me a little bit. And it was very toxic uh, thing to believe as a young person. So I, I really thought that it was going to be a very simple path. And um, slowly, we, as we went out with the novel, it, it, uh, it, you know, you, you, I think, have a knowledge of the publishing industry, and it's hard to, it's hard. To, you have to get unanimous consent among most acquisitions board of publishing houses. Sure. And uh, we just slowly failed. You know, it was not a quick failure, quick referendum. It was a slow failure. Uh, one Random House, no Scribner, no. You know, uh, um, all these different places, Picador, just the big houses sent glowing rejection letters, very kind, mm. very gallant rejection letters. Right, so right. Um, those stack up, you know, now I'm working in DC and I uh, have a job that I really don't like, a uh, writing job, um, you know, uh, get married, uh, write another novel. Um, it also fails to sell. Uh, really, I didn't do a very good job. At this point, you're just writing for a career, you know, trying to get in the door real fast. I'm sure, you know, you can relate to the difference between doing something out of a state of, you know, excitement and enthusiasm, inspiration versus something you, where you're just trying to kind of check a box. Oh, yeah. um, and, um, you know, now I'm in, you know, late 20s, uh, right, right around 30, I probably got this idea. And then, um, you know, I still, I always wrote, I still write, you know, I write, I publish short stories and I, I, I wrote another novel this year, but I, I, I'll never, that part of me won't die, but I, I found this other way to kind of have a career, mm -hmm. uh, to tell stories and to, to, you know, to create a, create a business around them. I, I, one of the people we interviewed for this series was a really talented singer. And one of the first questions I asked her was what's the relationship between entrepreneurialism and creativity now? And she said, creative people have to be business people. Mm -hmm. She had an unbelievable, she had just built scaffolding for her career slowly, but through relationship building and through 
seeking opportunities, asking for them, doing a great job while she, when she got them. And that that is such a common tale now. Um, not common enough, but but common. And, mm-hmm. and you know, um, I it, it was a breath of fresh air for me to start this business. It was hard and it took years. You know, we're in the fifth year and we're we're, we're having success that I have wanted to have for a long time. And it was a lot of painful years to get here, but it, it was, we had agency and I was able to do it. He was able to go out and try to make something happen instead of continuing to ask gatekeepers for permission to be creative. It's a really horrible idea. It's a really mm. bad path and your life passes and you're not doing anything that you're really that proud of, except continuing to ask. And, you know, people oftentimes who aren't doing it themselves, who, who aren't very creative, who don't have any any discernible uh, gifts except they got into a place where they can tell people who can and who can't be a part of things and i some of them are, are very good at it i'm not trying to gain say the profession it's just that i i think if i think the path for creative today really is more open it doesn't really seem like it sometimes it can be deceptive but i do think there are more more as possible now than there has ever been. And um, uh, someone who suspects that they're good at filmmaking tomorrow can go to a local business and say, guys, let me do something for you for free. Put it on your channel, see how it works. If it's great, you know, let me pay me for the next one. If not, okay, you know, we did, didn't work out here, but the, someone can go and get started tomorrow. And, uh, you know, technology has democratized filmmaking in a way that the barrier to entry is lower than ever. And, um, you know, I, I, Wes, we did, you know, we went and did it for free for a little while and got, uh, got reasonably good. Um, you know, we were not good at first, but we kept doing it. And so I, I just think that that's, I, I'm, I'm optimistic about that one part of it, at least. Yeah, it's interesting in listening to you, I, I started thinking about the sort of the revolution in, in the music industry in, in the late 90s and early aughts and then the publishing industry over the last few years. We can we can access the technology just today. Somebody who's a lawyer uh, contacted me and said, hey, what is your podcasting gear set up? Oh, you're starting a podcast. Awesome. Yeah, sure. Let me share it with you. Da, 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 da. Hmm. Because I think we it's it's like I don't know if you saw pump up the volume with Christian Slater back in the day, but that that movie is very powerful in that the, the whole theme is have your say. Right. You you can have a voice. And so when I'm listening to you and I'm going, OK, to me. An artist is an entrepreneur. You have to be. You have to be. And I I actually, in addition to these interview episodes, I do the other four days of the week, I do sort of exploration episodes. And I one of the things recently I've been talking about how artists need to be entrepreneurs. And so with that, when we're talking about that, how how does someone who maybe isn't a filmmaker do the you know and i'm not saying go give all your secrets zach that's not what i'm saying but but there are opportunities here for creatives maybe not just in in movie making but what about musicians what about writers what about singers how can they participate in this whole new way of being creative while at the same time keeping your agency and sort of being your own boss well um i don't think that comes easy and i don't think it comes quickly we do a lot of things that if there were you know if we didn't have payroll to make or business to support, we wouldn't do, right? So we're, we're doing them really for the, the market reasons, not for the creative love of it. Um, mm-hmm. That Not, you know, less and less, right? Now we're getting to a point where we're doing more stuff that um, is creatively fulfilling, but it, it took a while to get that balance right. Um, so I think it's possible musicians, so this is a, in large part with this series asks that we're, that we're, we're discussing now. And uh, we, had a, we had a really talented musician whose episode probably will be up by now, Allison Clark here in Nashville also, who um, she told a really great story. She said she was, she didn't have a record deal. She was talking to a, an executive publishing company and he was telling her how one of the things that he does is he reaches out to the owners of playlists on all these, um, you know, Spotify and other, other streaming platforms. Mm-hmm. And he asked, say, hey, can you include, you know, we just signed this artist. Can you include them in your playlist? And he goes, and that has really helped our artists get discovered. And so she says, well, I don't need a publishing deal for that. I don't need a record deal for that. I can reach out to these people. And play so she starts reaching out to the owners of people who the, the, uh, the administrators of playlists, she increased her monthly listeners from 200 a month to 20,000 a month. Wow. On her own. On her own. No, no deal, no record deal. 
just decided she was going to spend the time to make the lists and ask people and, you know, create a, a formidable ask and try to offer value. And she did it. Um, I think that creatives, I don't, I don't, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this too. I don't know what, something is wrong with us because we don't apply our creativity to our lives. We apply it to our work and we are thrilled to escape reality, to apply it to the work, but we tend not to apply that same creativity to the schematic of our career and how we are going to be happy. <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> I do. And yeah. you know, it's interesting because uh, believe it or not, this makes me think of Cuba. And the reason is because in, in this society, in our culture, we are taught from an early age that if you're an artist, you're doing it partly for the love of the game. And so you keep your day job and then you make your art in the in the late evenings and that somehow those two are separate and artists are taught not to value their work in the marketplace so so being creative thinking outside the box and going wait a minute i i am entitled to this i'm entitled to this sort of success comes at a price because then we're bucking what society tells us whereas in cuba and this is very interesting to me the artist is a worker, like a plumber, like a doctor, like a teacher, like an architect. The artist is a worker. And you are you should and are encouraged to feel entitled to having art be the work of your life. So I think it's different. I think something goes on for us here in the USA, certainly, and probably many other parts of the world, where we're not encouraged to think of ourselves as being deserving of, of compensation for the art that we make. And so therefore, a lot of us go, well, I'm not going to try and come up with ways of getting paid for what I do creatively because it's something that I, you know, I'm not quitting my day job and this is something I do on the side. So when when I'm hearing your call, Zach, and I'm going, oh, he's going, yeah, we should be creative with our lives. We should be thinking outside the box in this way. That that calls to mind again, that's that psychology that I'm talking about. And so I'll turn it back to you. What do you think creatives need to do? in order to position themselves for success? Well, I I think it's we're, we're in a trickier spot. I understand the comparison, you know, like, well, we have to navigate capitalism. Right. And we can't escape that because we just, we just do. We have to navigate the market and we have to figure out, you know, we have to figure out how to, how to create something that's important to us, but that is also valuable to people. And that's the balance of, yes, you know, I mean, it's just, it's an unfortunate trade-off, you know, um, letters to a young poet Rilke said, the only test of an art of a work of art is, did you need to create it? Mm. You know? And so I would like to believe that. And I kind of do believe that, right. If something grabs you and you absolutely have to make it, probably it's going to be meaningful. Um, but then you have to say, well, on the other side of that, you know, you, you, there is some cream rises to the top test here. And there is some uh, ability, you know, people are going to, people are going to judge it. And people, the, one of the, one of the metrics of that judgment is going to be, did people, you know, care and, and did they show up for it? And did they say nice things and things like that? So I, I think that there's something we have to keep in mind. I do. I think we have to, we have to think through that. Then the other thing I would say is everything about the creative mindset is somehow set up to oppose the act of creation itself. Mm. You know, we're, we're, we think things through to death. Um, <laughs> I went to a um, thing at uh, the uh, film Institute and everybody, you know, was asking questions and stuff and they were great questions. Like they really imagined all possible intricate ways of failure and asked about them. You know, there's an unbelievable imagination about what can go wrong with creatives. Um, but, you know, if you, if you ask that same room of people who are so articulate and so, um, you know, uh, insightful. Well, how many of you, you know, made a film? How many of you have written a, a book? Or how many of you have, have actually done this thing that you love so much? There are very few hands. Mm -hmm. And I think that happens because create the creative mindset is, it's like they're open to possibilities to the point of paralysis. Mm -hmm. They're so aware of what can go wrong. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're very aware of cliche. They would do not want to repeat a cliche. So they start, you know, so, so we're going to watch out for that over here. Then over here, we, we want to try new things, but they know most of them are not going to work. Um, a lot of them are disdainful of routine and discipline. Um, you know, a lot of them are, do not want to be confined to a category, right? And, but creatives just hate categories. I'm, I'm guilty of that too. You just don't want to be labeled in some specific thing that you do. 
um, and everything that's created is subject to a category. So you you know as soon as you do that, it's like okay, I'm a documentary guy. Okay, I'm a you know I'm, a, I'm I make comedies, and people are like, well, well, that's my whole life now, you know. So before right. they even start, they start thinking of how it could go wrong. So for these reasons, and they're good reasons, some of them, uh, the most common thing that happens is we don't make anything, and uh, you know life just becomes a kind of a theory that just passes. So I think uh, I think that's the number one thing to reach out, watch out for is is you know, you love something, you say that you love it anyway, are you doing it, you know, and if you're doing it, are you putting it out there? And that's, it's a very basic first couple steps, but I think most people are still at those steps. You and I are mind melding in some really fascinating ways because literally tomorrow and by tomorrow, I mean, June 3rd, uh, my, I, I'm doing a week long thing about inaction and tomorrow literally is the episode that is coming out that is all about inspiration without action leads to stagnation. Literally, that's the episode. That's that's the the key because small actions are still actions, but you need to take them. If you're inspired to do something, you must do it. Otherwise, you'll stagnate, and then you'll wonder, like you said, Zach, how come life is passing me by? This is weird. What's going on? So, I, I, your point is extremely well taken, and I love that you said it because it's so important for us to actually act on those inspirations, on that. And it's funny the this is the innovative mindset, but the first and original name for the show was the creative mindset podcast. So, so really literally we're like, <laughs> we're cool. mind melding. Um, yeah. I, I love, well, yeah. go ahead, please. Well, ahead. Well, I, just, I, I think that's really right. I mean, I, I don't do, you, um, on the other side, and I say this, like I sound, I sound hectoring. I'm answering the questions, but I I'm guilty of these things. That's why I, I know them so well. You know, I can speak about these things cause I'm, I've fallen for all of them at one point. Um, and so I just want to be clear about that, but I also, what, it, what's interesting is, you know, you, you're just talking about inaction, but what are entrepreneurs so good at? Oftentimes this is the only thing they're good at. Do you, you know what I'm thinking of? Yeah, I, I mean, to me, it's starting doing, but yeah, feel free. Action. Action. It's yeah. action. They, they, yeah. There's Sam Walton in his, in his biography said he, the thing that made him successful was a bias toward action. Yeah. And it's, it's, they are, they oftentimes lack so much so many of the tools that creatives have at their disposal but they're great at going out failing doing it again figuring out you know what are the thing what's the thing i need to do differently this time Me, you know meeting a bunch of people seeking out opportunity they're they don't need to be as quote unquote smart or as quote unquote creative or original because they're going to take so many more at bats so if creatives could borrow even 10 percent of that energy you know it would really make for for i think a hell of a transformation Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the whole point to me. I, I, I love this conversation and I know that you have a life to get back to, so I don't want to keep you too long, but do you have time for a couple more questions before we do the bonus round? Absolutely. Okay, great. So I want to look to the future. Let's take a look at what you envision for creatives and brands. Need, what, what are they going to need to do to sort of position themselves for succeeding as people want more entertainment and less advertising i think it's a two-sided marketplace i think um i think it's i think it's one that's slowly being realized i think that creativity and commerce as we've said is i've always had a relationship but i think now there are these small groups of people out there whose goal it is to make you know moving and, and human-centered content and at the same token on the other hand you have brands that recognize that this exact content is the best strategy for for business growth so this adds up to this two-sided market that puts brands in the driver's seat of consumers' attention, but makes creatives who in some other decade, you know, might've had very few options, it makes them newly valuable to the market. Mm. So I, I think that, I think that's gonna continue to develop, you know, in a perfect world, what do I think happens? I think we have a lot more, I think, I think you have brands communicating in a way that is much less annoying to the typical <laughs> consumer. Right. And I think, I think the I think creatives are given a sort of a new way in. I don't think this is necessarily like I met somebody recently and I said branded content and and I most people don't know what I mean. And this guy was had been an actor and he said, "Oh, well, wait." And he goes, "Oh, well, that's how creatives can get can get paid uh, to start their career." That was his first reaction to it. Mm. And I thought that was a great reputation for it to have because I think that's really 
the dream for everyone is look, I wake up and I decide I'm going to make a movie about oranges and that's, that's it. And I'm going to go out and get it funded. And I'm the streaming platform is going to put it out there. And maybe some people get to that level. Maybe some don't, but either way, I think this is new, new, a new ladder for, for creatives to get started and to have a, uh, a, <laughs> like in Kevin Spacey's words in American Beauty, a life that doesn't so closely resemble hell. Because uh, I think everyone knows when you want to be doing something really interesting and collaborating with talent and actors and, and writers and being with your people and figuring out, you know, how to do the next exciting thing. And instead, you're, you know, answering emails about insurance premiums. You you can't imagine going forward another day. You just can't imagine life. And so I think this is a wonderful alternative to that. I, you know, you're again, you're singing my song, you're playing my tune. Absolutely. And, and it is to me when I, when I'm listening to you, I'm going, yeah, there's, there, are, that is a beautiful way to, to be creative and still sort of fulfill both aspects of, of, of success, creative success, but also let's, let's call it what it is, financial success. It lets you do that in a way that is, uh, possible for both prongs of that life. And and I'm <laughs> as someone who's had to navigate that for most of my career, sure. I completely understand. You know, I worked at NASA for many years doing environmental education while at the same time being a professional full time musician. So it was it was a wacky life. Um, that's, that's great. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Oh, I believe me, I do. So I, yeah. uh, I have I have one last question. But before we get to it, I would love it if somebody wants to know more about you and also human factor media would you mind because i know people learn differently it's going to be in the show notes of course but i'd love it if you would give like your website and your socials so that sure. if somebody wants to follow you they can sure human factor media we're on um instagram youtube linkedin facebook uh you can email me well so our website is humanfactormedia.co mm -hmm. co and my email you can email me directly z-a-c-k at humanfactormedia.co Awesome. That's fantastic. Thank you, Zach. I appreciate it. I Before I ask the, the last question, which is one I ask of everybody who comes on the show, I really want to thank you for taking the time. This is this is this conversation has been catnip to me. I love it because so it, fun. I really enjoyed it, too. It's great to talk to someone who, who's just on the same uh, the same plane. So I appreciate yeah, it. We, we've mind melded a whole yeah. bunch in this last hour. So this last question is one I ask everybody who comes on the show. And the question is this. If you had an airplane that could skywrite anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? Oh, geez. Skywrite, so it's text in the sky. Mm -hmm. and, and it's short. Say, how long <laughs> do I have a word count? Is it like Twitter where I have to like <laughs> I know, right? Well, imagine skywriting. You you tend not to see more than maybe a couple of sentences tops. Uh, oh, boy. Uh, let's say fail admirably. I love it. I love it. That's great. Yeah, it makes it makes all sorts of sense too, especially since hearing some of your personal philosophy in this last hour. I'm going, yeah, that's that's it. Be, don't be afraid to land on your butt because you can get right back up again. So I appreciate that very much, Zach. Thank you again for being on the show. Don't go away because we are absolutely going to come back and do the quick bonus episode. But until then, this is Isolde Trachtenberg for the Innovative Mindset Podcast reminding you to always be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new, and it would mean the world to me if you told a friend about it. Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright 2022. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, remember to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind.